Our second scripture today is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. This picks up uh, right from where I ended the last sermon that I preached, uh, where we were in, in Paul's letter to the Romans in the beginning of chapter 8, and we talked about uh, the, the fact that those who are in Christ are in the Spirit, not in the flesh, and there is no condemnation left. Um, Paul continues on, and you'll hear some of that language again about flesh and spirit, but I think the, uh, the direction that he goes from here is going to be really helpful for us uh, in, in these times that we're in. So I invite you to listen for God's word in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if... By the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. In 1955, Annette Atkins and Bob Harvey were juniors at Garfield High School in Woodbridge, Virginia. When Bob first met her, he said, she was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life. I fell madly, totally, 100% in love with her. We had a wonderful junior year. And during that year, they dated exclusively. They went to prom together. They imagined getting married and growing old together. And then over the summer, Annette, went to Florida on a family vacation, and she met another boy. When she came back for their senior year, she broke it off with Bob. He was heartbroken. They each ended up marrying other people, having children and successful careers and happy lives, until both eventually lost their spouses over, a third, or over 60 years later. After Bob's wife died in 2017, he realized that he had really never stopped thinking about it. He looked her up online and actually found her husband's obituary. So he decided to send a condolence card with his number in it. She called him back eight days later after receiving it. Turned out she'd been thinking of him too. They connected for the first time in over 60 years over the phone. And they talked about how good it would be to see each other again. So Bob immediately got into his car and started driving out to Ohio where she lived. Three days later, he arrived on her front porch with flowers in his hand. And when Annette opened the door, she said it was like 1956 all over again. It was as if no time had separated them at all. They picked up right where they left off as juniors. In just a few months, Bob proposed, and Annette said yes. And they were married in a classic 50s-style wedding with jukeboxes and their old prom music and everything. They both said it was like a Hallmark movie come to life. Can you imagine carrying a torch for someone that long? Living a whole other lifetime, waiting 63 years to marry your true love? I wonder if any of us think that we would have that kind of patience. 
In our reading from Romans today, Paul has a message for the church about patience and perseverance. It's an inspiring and encouraging message, one that might even seem especially relevant to us in this particular moment in history. When he writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. I think we know what he's talking about. I think we've all got a sense of the sufferings of this present time. We're living through a public health crisis like we've never seen before. Enduring lockdowns and loneliness and lost work. At the same time, we're watching angry protests, civilians butting heads with troops and police on our own soil. We're seeing racial inequality and indifference to one another's pain. We're arguing with each other about whether wearing a mask is an act of compassion or an act of oppression. We're hearing world leaders blaming each other, blaming experts, blaming their people, blaming everybody but themselves for all that we are suffering right now, for all the issues that plague us. And I think that we could say creation is groaning, bound up in futility and decay. Sure seems that way to me, at least. But I think even beyond the challenges of COVID-19 and the social unrest that we see, it's fair to say that the world has always been under strain, some degree of strain. If you look close enough, there is always injustice somewhere. There is always hunger. There is always poverty. There is always sadness. There is always abuse and exploitation to be found in this broken world. And we, the children of God, we should have good reason to hope for something better, right? We really want to believe that something better is coming, don't we? But if we hope for what we do not see, says Paul, then we wait for it with patience. Oh, man. Paul, did you have to use the P word? I, I admit, patience is a virtue that is hard to hold on to. Patience does not seem like our strong suit. I mean, we're a generation that expects everything instantly. We want victory without showing up for practice. We want joy without going through the journey. We are a culture of microwaves, of fast food, of high-speed internet. We can shop online, we can date online, we can worship online. Yes, I see the irony there. We, we can watch TV and movies on demand, whatever we want. We can have Amazon Prime deliver it to our door by tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying that all of this accessibility or availability is itself a bad thing. It's not. It's great that we can get what we need when we need it. The problem is that we learn habits of instant gratification that leave us ill-equipped to deal with those things that do not come instantly. We don't know how to wait, how to long, how to commit. How to groan patiently through the process. Patience, young grasshopper. You've probably heard that line before, even if you don't know where it comes from. I was, I was dead convinced that this was from the Karate Kid movies, but I looked it up and apparently it's from a 1970s action-adventure show called Kung Fu, where the half-American, half-Chinese main character, Wai Chang Kang, roams the Old West using his martial arts skills to, uh, to set things right, to fight injustice, and to fight on behalf of those who are oppressed. Throughout the series, there are flashbacks to a young Kane training with his Shaolin monk master, who frequently calls him Grasshopper, and admonishes him to not give up on whatever lesson he's supposed to be learning. Patience, young Grasshopper. That phrase is part of our lexicon now. Whenever we're teaching a student or a child, and they seem to be getting frustrated. It's, it's what springs to mind. I've said this to Charlotte probably this week, probably more than once. As the adult or the professor or the master, we know how long it takes to develop the skill that we're working on. We know how long it took us, and we can identify with the frustration of the student, but also remind that student that time and perseverance are required for mastery. 
You just can't get there instantly with some things. You can't learn to tie your shoes overnight. You can't become the next Aaron Rodgers or LeBron James without practicing. You can't get as famous as Meryl Streep or Tom Hanks or Leonardo DiCaprio without putting in the work. You're not going to be an overnight success. You've got to mature. And it works just the same way with the kingdom of God. It will not appear overnight. It must mature and develop within us and around us. God is working his purposes out. Just a little bit later in this chapter, Paul will declare that all things work together for those who love God. And this takes time. But does it have to hurt so much? Does it have to be as hard as it seems to be? Does it have to feel like labor pains? Like groaning inwardly as we wait for something to come to life? Our suffering often feels like it's just too much, and the payoff is just too little, or too distant, or too uncertain. When Paul says that the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the future glory that awaits us, I'm afraid that either he doesn't know what he's talking about, or we don't. Either he doesn't really understand what we're going through, or we don't understand how it might all be a necessary part of the process to produce the future glory. Prior to becoming the President of the United States, James Garfield was principal of Hiram College in Ohio. And one time when a father asked if, if his, his student, his child, um, who was struggling, he asked Garfield if the course of study couldn't be simplified so that his son might finish school sooner. Garfield replied, certainly. But it all depends on what you want to make of your boy. When God wants to make an oak tree, he takes a hundred years to do it. When he wants to make a squash, he requires only two months. Maybe what God is doing in this world, in us, is more than a two-month project. Maybe there's something happening in the midst of our struggle that we don't see yet. Does anybody know how champagne is made? Well, I'm sure that several of you know what champagne is for, right? You know how to tell a good one from a bad one, and you enjoy having a, a chilled bottle on hand for the appropriate occasion. This sparkling wine, champagne, is synonymous with good times and victory laps and celebrations of success, right? You likely know the name Dom Perignon. What you may not know is that Dom Perignon was, in fact, a 17th century Benedictine monk who developed a handbook for how to craft the champagne that is named after him. There's a myth about him that when he accidentally created the first sparkling wine, he called out to the other monks, Brothers, come quickly and try this! I am tasting the stars! If you tour the Abbey of Motherville in France, where he lived, you can follow the production process of a bottle of champagne. And it begins with the grapes, thousands and thousands of grapes tended to in the vineyard. They are grown under careful supervision until they become plump and ripe, and then they are harvested. They're plucked, they're put into storage in great bunches, and eventually those bunches of grapes go to the wine press. The grapes get pressed and crushed to extract all the juice. It's all squeezed out, it's all gathered up, and then the dregs go back into the press and get crushed another time just to make sure they got all of it. That juice is then poured into plain, unmarked bottles. The bottles are taken down to a cave, to, to a cellar. There are no labels on these bottles yet, because there is plenty that can still go wrong in the winemaking process, and the winemaker first wants to see what happens, wants to see which bottles survive. They're not gonna slap their label on it until they actually have a, a worthwhile, saleable wine. So down in that cellar, the grape juice ferments. And fermentation is a chemical reaction occurring within the bottle, and it, it, it creates incredible pressure. These bottles are designed to withstand that pressure. But sometimes it's still too much, 
and a bottle shatters. It explodes. It throws glass all over the cave that could injure anybody who might happen to be down there, or even set off a chain reaction, striking other bottles and, and, and destroying them. But if the bottle survives, it probably spends one and a half to three years in the cave, although many are held even longer than that. And then they go on to a riddling rack. It's a huge wine rack that holds the bottles at a specific angle. And the master riddler comes along and he adjusts these bottles several times a day, every day, for four to six weeks. He's, he's shifting them, he's, he's turning them, spinning them, and, uh, and changing the angle on them so that during that time, all of the sediment in the bottle will, will run down into the neck. It'll all gather and consolidate in the neck of the bottle so that only the crystal clear champagne is left in the body of it. And then the neck is flash frozen and the sediment is disgorged, which is basically using the pressure in the bottle to blow it out. And then the bottle gets recorked and it goes back into the cellar to continue aging until it's ready to drink. The whole process takes years. If you look at it from the perspective of the grape or the bottle, it is painful. Right? Being pulled off of the vine, being plucked up from your place of comfort, being crushed and squeezed, and then poured out, and then confined in a dark place, under intense pressure for a long period of time, and then you get hassled, disrupted constantly by this unseen hand. All the waste, all the garbage that's settled into your life gets forcibly expelled. And then you're left again on your own for who knows how long. Friends, Paul is real with us about the suffering we face in this life. Nothing worthwhile comes instantly. There is a future glory that we await, and there is a present trial that we endure. And when he declares that the glory outweighs the suffering, he says it as one who has suffered far more for the sake of the gospel than I think any of us have. Shipwrecks, imprisonment, beatings, false allegations, we haven't been through any of that. And I don't say that to diminish or minimize the suffering you might be going through. I know that what you're going through is real and it hurts. I just mean that Paul gets what suffering is, and he still trusts that God's promise is worth it. Maybe you feel forgotten in your suffering like an unmarked, unseen bottle placed in a cave along with thousands of others, none of you having any identity. Maybe you feel like you are not important. But there's a reaction, not a chemical reaction, but a spiritual reaction going on inside of you. You might feel some pressure from that. You might think that you can't take it. You might think that there isn't anything on the other side that will merit the pain that you're in right now. But you are made, you're specially built, not just to endure this pressure, to survive it and to produce something worthwhile out of it. Don't explode and let everything God is doing in you be ruined, be wasted. Don't blow up and let your own destruction cause damage to others. Wait for it. Wait for it. Because you are designed to be a part of the greatest celebration ever. Bob and Annette Harvey had to wait 63 years to reconnect with each other. And maybe that seems like an impossibly long time to you. The fact is that every one of us will have to wait our entire lives, no matter how long or how short they may be, we'll have to wait for our entire lives to be reconnected fully with our true love. We will spend the entirety of this present life in an almost but not quite complete relationship with our Lord, not yet tasting the celebration, the end product, until the day of resurrection. And the only choice that we really have in this process is whether we will wait with patient longing or we will lose sight of the goal and give it up for something else.
Don't forget, friends, that we already have the first fruits of the Spirit as we wait for God's adoption and redemption in our lives. Everything of worth, everything of value takes time. So patience, Grasshopper. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.